Welcome to the February meeting of the BSFA. <coughs> Today we have two very special guests, um, author David Gullick, and um, I say it's literary master. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How do you flatter you? <laughs> so, um, David Gullick is a London based author. He has just released a revised edition of the SF and Double Shop Apocalypse through New Congress. A Bonnie and Clyde story for the Trump era, and it's gathering praise from all quarters. Um, he will be in conversation with Ian Waits, former BSFA chair, editor, and owner of the multiple award winning New Press, and prolific author. He has many wonderful books out there to be read, including his latest space opera series, The Dark Angels. I didn't even have to pay you for that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, tell us about your new book. It's called Tantric Shopping, and it's about how to turn the everyday activity of commodity purchasing into a spiritually fulfilling experience. What was your inspiration? The gods are everywhere, so they must be in shopping. It's a path towards enlightenment we tread daily, yet treat as a mundane activity. We still have much to learn. Tell me more. <laughs> We're ascending towards a new godhead. It's a male god. And that means turbo, max power, triple X, high performance. We can get there, but first we need to free the goddess in the mouths. Is tantric shopping anything to do with tantric sex? Absolutely. They are both forms of meditative worship using yin-yang sex magic. The credit card is the phallus of the male aspect, the slot the goddess. The transaction is our sacrifice. And, and what will God do if we don't free the goddess? What do all men want? He's going to screw us and cast us aside. When we sacrifice to the goddess, when we buy things, we are transacting with a holy prostitute, a priestess of Ishtar. How did you make this discovery? When you think about it, it's obvious. Like so many things, the gods want us to know. Hermetic knowledge hidden in plain sight? Exactly. You're a wise and observant person. Actually, I'm an AI. I am. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I knew that. <laughs> this doesn't make much sense. Well, well, sense is the last thing we need. Abandoning sense gives meaning to an otherwise empty gesture. Seek the mystery of free market commercial modalities with your heart, not your head. Let the act of shopping, the art of shopping, unfold like a koan. <laughs> How do you suggest we start? Consider the lotus as a flower constructed of tilde seats instead of petals. And there you have an expert excerpt from Shapocalypse. Actually, yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Sue so so um, aptly and and so. Um, effusively um, <laughs> introduced us. I'm Ian, this is Dave. Um, we're here to talk about a new novel which um, came out, is going to be coming out at EasterCon. I say new, it was actually out in an earlier form, but has been polished like a jewel. It has been exquisitely shaped into a new form. It's been revised, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're going to kick off with a proper reading now, rather than that brief excerpt and exchange from Dave from Shapocalypse and then we'll get into talking a bit more about Dave, um, his writing and particularly, this is going to come as a surprise, Shapocalypse. Dave. Okay. Um, Can you all hear us by the way? Please. Perfect. Early morning. Novik and Josie hit another mark. They blitzed the levels in a controlled and methodical demonstration of no holds barred total shopping. Security guards formed an impromptu escort to keep the crowds away. Overexcited teenage boys and girls bared their chests for autographs. Cheering shoppers carried their bags until they collapsed from hyperventilation. When Novik brought out the jewellery store, the shop manager levitated. Her laid off staff carried them to the Cadillac on their shoulders through a ticker tape parade. The next day they did it again. The day after, they did it twice. Word had spread, a small crowd of people were waiting at the first mile and streamed excitedly into the ground floor concourse. Good-natured security guards shook hands with Maritha, smart in her new uniform of tight white leggings, knee-high black patent boots and a frogged and braided black jacket. Pausing to admire, admire her Wolfenhorn 68, 
snug in its protect and destroy holster, the guards escorted Novik, Josie, Miritha and Benny from shop to shop. Staff applauded as they passed by. Children ran in front of them and scattered rose petals at their feet. Novik was disconcerted by the attention. Where did all these people come from? How did they know? The mesh, the web, I, I guess we're famous now, Josie said. And Novik didn't like it. He wanted to do something useful. He didn't want to be famous. And he certainly didn't like the idea that those men who once owned Mr. Carr might know where he was. Men and women leaned over the barriers, frantically waving their store cards. Which logos? Teach us shopping. Where do we go? Tell us. Novik paced back and forth like a trapped animal. Josie held up her hands. The crowd hushed, expectant. Even the security guards became attentive. Everyone, thank you for coming. We love you all. We really do. Now it's time for us to do more shopping. An excited murmur ran through the crowd. Josie calmed them again. And it's time for you to do the same. Where? A voice cried. What? Anywhere. Anything you want, Josie said. Confused, the crowd milled uncertainly. Which brands? Whose endorsements? A few people at the edges moved hesitantly towards the nearest shop. Yes, go there, Josie called encouragingly. And there. Maritha stood in front of the crowd, her hand straight to her holster. Buy what you can, while you can. It was as if her words were a signal. The crowd streamed through the mouth. Parents linked arms and strode forwards, the young children skipping happily in their wake. The young couples dodged and dived, mutual flugelmen in the dogfight of the milling press, while pensioners elbowed their way forwards with the expert economy of veterans. Novik watched the mass of shoppers pour into a dozen shops, seize whatever came to hand and crowd around the tools. One by one they emerged, faces flushed with retail serotonin. The high faded fast, eyes glazed, Mouths open, they stood in the atrium, frozen like victims of early onset dementia. Then some new display caught their eye, a two-for-one offer, free credit, a limited edition. Jaws firm, shoulders straightened, and they hurried into another shop. This isn't what I wanted, they were excited. It's what we've got, babe, Josie said sympathetically. The mall manager intercepted them as they edged towards the wide exit doors. What's happening? Where are you going next? Are you done here? Yeah, we're done here, Levick said despondently. Come again tomorrow. Enjoy your commodities. Levick drove them through the outskirts of Amarillo, the blacktop heavy with commercial traffic, the deserted sidewalks dark with recent rain. Outside, acre after acre of brightly painted self-storage warehousing rolled by. Inside the car, the gentle hush of the aircon grew quietly intrusive. Look at all this lad industrial turning to self-store, Novik said. It's the same old, same old, whatever the solar system, Benny said. It's almost a universal law, like gravity or how to make a perfect martini. Humans are like the monkey who wants the peanut in the bottle. You've got hold of what you want, but now you're trapped by your own greedy little fist. Maritha looked at Benny with new respect. We've got to learn to let go, I see that now. It's a savage indictment, but that's who we are, Novik said, a bunch of grasping apes. So who am I, Mr. Carr said. You're a rebel, a turncoat, an escapee, a contra against the system that spawned and sustained you. I never thought of myself that way, Mr. Carr said. So how do you? I, Mr. Carr hesitated. Well, this is a surprise. I check my topic buffers, and it seems I just don't. Then it's about time you did. Back on the road, through the compliant, over-respectful crowd, heading towards another mile, Novik felt energised, his psyche vibrant. How about this? You'll define your own doom. Built-in obsolescence is a form of autom automotive existential despair, a ferrous epiphany. Rust is the automobile's equivalent of mortification of the flesh. I don't rust. I'm photo-unstable. Same difference. Novik said with total assurance. The search for identity and meaning is real for any entity with a facility to introspect, irrespective of their substrate or origin. Babbage's freshly waxed nutsack. I have to think about this, Mr. Carr said. 
and before anyone could respond, the engine cut out and the dashboard went black. Apocalypse is a quite remarkable novel, and I want to come and, and talk about that at some length shortly. It, I first encountered it, incidentally, when I was a, a judge on the Arthur C. Clarke Award with um, with Georgie over there, and uh, it was it was it was different from anything else we had on the list. Wasn't it? <laughs> it rem uh, so quite remarkable. We're coming on to that, but I want to explore before we get there about how you came to Apocalypse, and and what I mean by that is, I mean, um, you you were born in Africa. Mm -hmm. When did you come to the UK? When I was three. So it's very much a family move that brought you to the UK? Yes. And do, you, do you feel your roots are the no, UK rather than Africa? Yeah. I ran away. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away <laughs> off my <laughs> um, That's an interesting question, and I change my mind regularly um, whenever I think about it. Um, I don't know that I feel particularly like I'm anything. I, so I think now I would say I feel British. Um, that's the best answer I can give. Okay, I like the hesitation. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, you've written for many years. You've had a lot of short stories out there, and um, I understand, by the way, um, congratulations, you've got one coming out in fantasy and science fiction as well. Yes. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. So and unlike the increasing, I've had one story in 14 <laughs> years, not 14 in one year. Like. <laughs> well done. Um, was Shapocalypse your first novel? No, it was my third. Dare I ask what became of the first two? Or is it best just to... <laughs> <laughs> the first one was actually shortlisted by Virgin Worlds, if anyone remembers Gosh, that. that was a while back. And I thought, wow, I've written my first novel, and I made it. And then Virgin Mills did whatever they did, and, and it imploded and it sank without trace, and that never went, went anywhere. Um, and the book that came after that never went anywhere either. And then I read this. How long was your apocalypse in the making? That was two years, yeah. And with all the writing and everything you were doing, you were also part of a writing group in London, um, the Tea Party. Yes. Which had considerable success with various members. Yes. Many um, honourable alumni like uh, Tom Polk and Elliot the Bowler and, and, and Gay. Yeah. And Roseanne, she was, she's a member of Roseanne, the yes. Roseanne Rabinowitz, Roseanne Rab Rab Rabinowitz who is still a member, I think. Yes, and several others. So it's uh, quite, quite a hotbed of, of talent there. Uh, I believe so, that I've not been a member for a few years. What benefits did you think you gained from being a member of the writers' group? The right writers group, which, which Tea Party was, gives you um, the right encouragement and feedback um, to do what you want. And I wanted to be published, and that was what the group was focused on. Um, and, and also gives you that vital extra thing, which is, I, I suppose, someone to share your pain with. Because you know, nobody makes you do this, and I do understand this, but it can become quite difficult, and sometimes you can think, why am I doing this? This is difficult. And, and just to get a, a, a hug off someone, whether it's a verbal one or otherwise, is really, really useful. Okay, so Shapocalypse came out originally in... 2014. 2014. Think, yes. When I read it, it struck me as being a quite insane but quite prophetic um, vision of a warped and twisted tomorrow, which could never, ever come to pass. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> I was thinking about this recently, and, and that's what I wanted to write. I wanted to write about this insane future that could never possibly happen. And now it feels that in some ways it's a slightly preferable alternative present. Just, just uh, I, I don't know if people have actually read Shapocalypse or, or um, not, hopefully not, because you might buy a copy then. But um, I'm just going to read you to give you an idea of, of what this is about, because Dave gave you a, um, a, a reading in isolation. I'm just going to read you a little bit of the blurb, which is, um, to start with, I nicked a line from the story when I did the tagline for the cover. 
take from the rich and shop for the poor, which I thought was a great sort of um, reworking of the um, old um, Robin Hood sort did of I thing. Actually wrote that? You did, it's somewhere in the text. I think I've changed the word. You wrote it, yes. Um, no, no, that was all my own invention. <laughs> the, the back blurb, it says a lot about the books. So I'm not going to read all of it, just a little bit. A Bonnie and Clyde for the Trump era, Josie and Novick embark on the ultimate road trip. In a near future re-sculpted politically and geographically by climate change, they blaze a trail across the shopping malls of America in a printed intelligent car stolen by accident with 190 million LSD contaminated dollars in the trunk. And that is the central thread, but it's only one thread. And another bit, meanwhile, Professor Genevieve Sarlo is bent on making America great again and cementing her place in history. She embarks on an ambitious but perilous campaign, invading Mexico on a pretext and plotting to assassinate the richest man in the world, or the world has ever known, basically to fund her, her exploits. Um, you, you had a number of things going on. There were a lot of viewpoint characters, and you wrote it in a quite episodic um, manner that almost reminded me at times which you interspersed it with, with sort of like video blogs and with other things and it, it put me in mind a little bit of Brunner's um, stand on Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious thing or was that something that you just found worked for what you were doing? I haven't really thought of it in terms of stand on Zanzibar but you're absolutely right. The, the episodic um, or rather the, the, um, the little sort of news inserts at the beginning of each chapter and things, really came from my memory of an old Frank Herbert book called The Dasadi Experiment, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which had all these little interesting um, sort of snippets yeah, and vignettes yeah. at the beginning of each chapter, and they explained how the world worked. Um, and I liked that. Um, and I knew it wasn't a particularly original idea, but I just thought this is a way of of world building, expanding the background. And then I had the idea was I could take a character out of the narrative thread and I could put it into the news and then I could bring them back out of it. And so if I'd done anything approaching original with that idea, that's what I did. And when I thought of that, I thought, I really like that. I'm going to do it. I want to talk for a moment about the richest people the world has ever known. Um, you have this wonderful family um, you could have made the ultra-rich, multi-trillionaire a right bastard, but he actually comes across as quite a nice individual. Um, and it's almost as if, I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but his, his daughter is almost the Dorian Gray aspect of things. She's actually taking the punishment for his excesses in a strange way. Um, was that a deliberate just, just a position that you wanted to... I mean, th this is quite an original twist to me. And I just wondered how you came up with that idea. I say, I don't want to give too much away, but it's, it's something that you do. It wasn't that coherent. Um, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is incredibly coherent. Um, once I thought about the richest man in the world, I, I, I thought, what it would be like to be a trillionaire? And then you do the sums and you think, that's ridiculous. How could anyone be? A, a multi-trillionaire and then he realised actually they would own the planet if they did which is what he does um, but his daughter um, his daughter is, is enormous physically she's gigantic and at the time I think bigger people were getting a really hard time in the press there was a lot of media what I would call fat shame um, and I didn't really like it um, and so I decided that I would write a sympathetic character. Um, and although everyone was blaming her for who she was, none of it was her fault. Um, and then, part way through the book, I thought, oh my goodness, I've written this odd kind of superhero. And, and, and she kind of, she told me, this is who I now am. I'm not someone who anyone can pity. I'm someone who's going to take names and, and, and kick ass. Um, which is what she does. Spoilers. <laughs> In a um, quiet way. <laughs> you have a plethora of viewpoint characters, although you, you focus 
on perhaps three or four, which mm. I think is a decent balance, but you have many others along the way. Did you have trouble keeping track of them when you were writing it? No, because I have the world's biggest spreadsheet. <laughs> um, and I would, uh, I would do all the things that people do with spreadsheets to connect and interlock and say, have I spent too much time here and not enough time there? And now, of course, I read all the advice about how to do this. And everyone says, you shouldn't worry about any of that. You should just get on and write it. That's, that's my attitude, but then that's me. <laughs> when, because um, your original publisher who was, um, it did a great job, produced a lovely volume, um, unfortunately no, went out of business. Yes. Um, you then had an opportunity to go back and revise it, which isn't something every author does. I mean, I, I don't know, um, as an author myself, I can tell you that I look at books now that came out 12 years ago and I think, God, I should have given that another pass. I should have done this. I should have really have worked on this a bit more. Yes. And you had the opportunity to do that. Yes. What was that like? It was great, because for one thing, you can fix all those typos um, and secretly introduce a few more. Um, <laughs> yes. Also, <laughs> troublemaker that one. I've got my eye on you, lady. <laughs> because it was an. There's always, there's always, I was about to say there's always one, but actually there's always two. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, good point. <laughs> because it was. Um, very close near future, it was also a great opportunity to go back and look at everything I've uh, sort of proposed and said, does that still make sense or actually was that done like two years ago now? Um, fortunately that wasn't really the case. Um, but I think the real opportunity was just to go and cut some fat. Um, I think it's about 5,000 words short of yeah, it, and I think it's a much better book because of that. Good because I, I must confess, I mean, it, it was it was an interesting project to work on. <laughs> it, it was an interesting project to work on because um, <laughs> yeah, why <YA. laughs> It was an interesting project because at one point I, I did feel that there were elements that could be cut out, but at the same time, you don't want to spoil the whole sprawling beauty of this BMS, this wonderful creation you've created which goes off in all directions and somehow it's all travelling in the same direction and it all ends up at the right place. So you don't want to interfere with any of that and the freedom, but at the same time there was just little bits and pieces that could be trimmed out. Yes, that's right. It's a paragraph here and a yeah. sentence there. And I think possibly a chapter as well. Here and, and, and I think we got rid of the character as well along the way, didn't we? But, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. But, okay. but, but the, sorry, the, I mean the spooling part of it, it, it's a global story. I wanted to write it from a few points around the world um, to uh, to reflect that because it's not just happening in America. Well, you, you took one of the characters and put her on a Polynesian island and, yes. and, and had bits and pieces happen to her and again I, I, no spoilers but she goes through a complete uh, growing process and adventures of her own yes. um, which could be considered by many editors. I must have I looked and thought do we need this character? Do, do, can we do with that? But I could see that you were going for a wider feel and a wider sense, so I didn't advise cutting it. Whereas I know that my own agent, who isn't here, Simon Kavanagh, he would have said, cut that character. Not vital. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, I thought, no, it's, it's the feel of the novel. We need this extra, extra dimension that the character brings. Um, and it also let me sneak in a little bit of magic as well. Yes. Well, reference nice. to magic. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I will say science, that... Science, magic, Arthur C. Clarke, I rest my guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it fascinating because you've written, um, in effect, this is near future because it, it's what the world is going to be like once climate change kicks in, um, once various other ha things happen. It's a very dangerous game. I remember, um, I remember Charlie Stross saying once that, um, you know, we can all write in the near future and um, that's great and we can all predict things. I mean, look at the fact we predicted the mobile phone, but nobody predicted happy slapping, which at the time was very happy, you know. So reality is always going to come up with something weirder and stranger than we do as writers. Yes. Current American administration being a case in point. Um, yes. Yet this holds up remarkably well, given that for, for what, um, five years now have passed since it was originally published, and yet, if anything, it's more relevant now than when it first came out. 
It's very kind of you to say that, and I'm quite pleased that it has. I mean, when I wrote it, I think Sarah Palin was the maddest thing in American politics. <laughs> oh, for uh, those days. <laughs> oh, for those happy days. And so I, I, I based my mad president on kind of, on her, I can only apologise that she has a form of, of self, self-belief and integrity, um, despite <laughs> being a monster. Um, because clearly that is not reality anymore. <laughs> okay. um, Chipocalypse is a wonderful novel. I would thoroughly recommend it, recommend it to anyone. But as you say, you finished writing the original version five years ago. Mm. Okay, you've revised it and you, you worked very hard on revising it. Um, you've got another um, something coming out since, which I think you've done, um, released in almost episodic versions on, online. And you. Um, I was looking at it the other day, called The Girl with a Thousand from a Thousand Fathoms. Girl from a Thousand Fathoms. Tell us about this. This is a, um, a fantasy, modern detective fantasy novel I read. Um, why did I write it? Someone said, help me out, Gay. Someone said. It was an old um, forum that we used to be on as members of Tea Party Writers. And there was this weird discussion. Um, and. At one point, I believe the phrase "women in wet red dresses." <laughs> <laughs> there was there was, was, there, was a web, the there was a website you could pick two characters oh, and yes. together they fight crime. And I got he's he's a burned out um, detective and she's a mermaid. Together they fight crime. So I, <laughs> so I thought that's crazy. I can write a short story about that. I can write a novel about that. <laughs> Um, and I did. Uh, and then, what the hell do I do with it? <laughs> and then, what do I do with it? And some people sort of quite liked it a bit. And I put it away. I parked it for several years. So I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I know what's wrong with this. Um, and this is the first time I've actually sat down and thrown a book away and then rewritten it from scratch. Wow, um, really? Yeah. Um, you kept none of the original at all? Well, I, I, I kept the... The story the and the characters, the plot, yeah. the words uh, are all rewritten, um, and that was interesting, and that was that was what the book needed. And then I thought, well, I'll try self-publishing. I'll give it away a chapter at a time on the interwebs and see what happens. Um, and then maybe I'll do a, a print edition, and maybe because I also do some leather work and I do a bit of book binding, so maybe I could actually make my own limited edition books, which would take like three days to make one. Um, <laughs> and, and, and maybe, not, and maybe yeah. not do very many of those. Um, <laughs> but I thought that would make a good high-end Kickstarter reward or something like that. Um, so I may still do that, but I'm really, really busy at the moment. And that's, that's still coming out, and I still will do the give it away on the internet. Have you written this entirely now, and you're oh, yes. writing it episodically, or yes, are you writing it as it goes? Yes, because I, I garner the days where I'll just write something and throw it out there. This has been, yes, this has been written, edited, proofed, test read, uh, and, and it's a proper book. Water seems to be a bit of a theme with you, because you also had a short story collection out, which was themed on wet things, <laughs> with a fabulous cover by... Um, but it looked as anyway to me like a da- Danny Sarah cover. Yes, yes, it is really, really nice cover. Um, yes, water is a theme that runs through my whole life, and I can't really explain it. But I do have a fascination for for it. So if you end up drowning, well, then there's a thing goes. I just thought you know we bring a light tone. To well, the I think the reason for this is when I came back from South Africa with my parents, aged three years and not much, when we crossed the equator, I was baptised by King Neptune <laughs> in the ceremony that they did on, on ships at that time. And I have my certificate, um, which I still have, and it's on the wall. And, and Neptune and the denizens of the deep have, have sworn that if I ever fall in the water, they will protect and defend me, and I shall not drown. And when I was five and six, gosh, that meant a hell of a lot to me because it was true. Uh, and because I believed it for so many years as a child, it's sort of quite who I am. Now. That's fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was weird. Yeah, that's fine. So, 
You mentioned at some point that there you might do a sort of sequel to Shapocalypse, which, which I find quite impossible to picture, but um, tell us more. I thought, oh, well, I've written a few thousand words of this in this sort of great burst of excitement as I was actually on the tube going somewhere and I had this idea and I just wrote it by, by hand and then wrote the rest of it as I was coming back and then typed it up afterwards and realised in, in like two hours I've written about 6,000 words which is wow. not what I do. In, in, in a month I might write 6,000 words normally. Um, so I thought Mr Carr, everybody likes Mr Carr which is a mystery to me. Um, but by the end of Shapocalypse, things have happened. So I wanted to write the next book from the point of view of that character. And the car. Yeah. Yes. yes. George, Georgie likes this. <laughs> Georgie approves. She loves the car. car. <laughs> <laughs> and it's difficult to do this with, without spoilers, but at the end of the book, certain things have, incredibly important things have happened. Um, and at the beginning of the second book, all of that optimistic stuff has just turned to shit. So it's like on a sort of um, SF more scale, joining the EU and then being kicked out of it because we're assholes. Um, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a nice. It's up, great. It'd be great. It's a nice uplifting novel for the um, new year. Well, so no, if the, yeah. Of course, we've got to go and um, get some redemption. Things and the, and the other thing we haven't really talked about is the parahumans, the um, intelligent animal human hybrids. Not yes. really, I never now, really was sure what they were. But there, there are two elements I want to come on to going back to your pockets. One is you've got gibbering now, but I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> the, 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 it does make sense if you've read the book, trust me. Sense in a very, you know, in a sort of way. Um, you've got. Mr. Carr, mm. which for some reason becomes a very endearing character. And I, for one, was quite disappointed when Mr. Carr disappeared out the story and was glad when he came back. Later. Sorry, give him spoilers, spoilers. Right. But, yeah. I don't know. but um, where did you get the idea of this printed intelligent car, which is almost like the it's probably over it to say that it reminded me of, um, of, of the computer on Red Dwarf, but it's, it's got this sort of... Yeah. Uh, no, 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 an independent night ride. Like, it's kit. Okay. Without it's, it's, it's kit with a bit of... Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> where, where did this whole concept come from? I don't know, it's not an example of <laughs> There's a little old lady in Schenectady. <laughs> and she ships me ideas wholesale. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. A lot of a lot of ideas sort of emerged in the planning for the for this book and, and how I like to work when I do do it properly is that I will spend a month or two just brainstorming ideas, just trying to get stuff out there, and it doesn't have to make coherent sense in any order. I, I'm I'm literally tearing up bits of paper this big and writing ideas down and putting them aside as many as I can, and I. I just do that until I've got this stack of bits of paper. God, Jay must be a saint then, because someone's <laughs> very disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God forbid that the cat comes through when it's all laid out on the floor, because then you get a completely new plot. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. <laughs> Where did Mr. Carr come from? I am not sure. Um, it's been a while. And, and you're getting all of it, and memory isn't what it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, you were, talk, you were talking about the parahumans. Now, j just to explain, again, um, our, our friend the multi-trillionaire has a semi-feral guard force around his estate, which is there to incredibly loyal to him and acts as his security force. And we come into conflict with this when many of the central characters end up converging on this estate for various reasons, some nefarious and some otherwise. Is that a fair summary of what you Yes. Is? Yeah, excellent. Yes. So where, where do they come from? They genuinely just emerged out of the world of the book. They, they, they became self-evident. Uh, I write a bit about sort of prototypes of these types of 
creatures where they are like very dog-like, but they're bright. But these were different, where you're just moving on to like bear people or wolf people. Um, and they were, in the end, they were delightful to write because they were very easy. They just presented me with their own worldview, their own mythologies, uh, which was odd because they'd just been sort of grown and put out in the world, but yet they had their own way of looking at things. And again, that's something in the sequel that I really, really wanted to go back and explore because I just sort of danced around an awful lot of who they were and, and why they were and what they thought, what their view of the world was. Like, I don't know. Do we see yes. any more of the, um, is it the Palfingers, the, 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 the ultra trillionaires? Do we see any more of the Dwarf or anything like that in the sequel? Or are you concentrating on Carr, on Mr. Carr and the... Um, uh, and the animal hybrids. At the moment, it's Mr. Carr and Novik is in prison. Ah, oh, so Novik still. Um, okay. And it's the um, power, what I could call the power humans. Yeah. Um, so no, they're they're not at the moment. I think that those stories have been that, told. That's been told, and you've moved that's on. Been told. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah, okay. Is this what you're concentrating on writing at the moment, or are there other things on the back burner or in, on the front burner? Maybe? Um, on the front burner is uh, a book that my no longer agent told me I shouldn't write. Um, Excellent. <laughs> and I decided to write it anyway, um, which is a, a it's moved, it's, it's sort of morphed a little bit, but the real inspiration is a prequel to The War of the Worlds from the point of view of the Martians, um, which I thought was brilliant. Um, but clearly, no one else in publishing did at the time. Um, don't, don't, don't feel let down by that. There's a lot of things <laughs> even in publishing. Um, so that's my main piece of work, and that ground to a halt at one point. 70,000 words into it, and I thought, I don't know what to do. So again, I stripped it all the way back down to the bones and stuff it again. And that's where I am at the moment. So this somewhere is the, this this is your principal project beginning. with um, Mr. Carr the sequel going on in the background. Well, quite substantially parked. And and, and of because course. there's short stories to write. I there's, say, there's, this, there's this anthology I'm editing for oh you. Oh God, yeah, that and, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, should we talk about that a little bit? We can talk about that. Yeah, let's get it. Yeah. Um, about I suppose probably about 14, 15 months ago, David approached me with this rather interesting idea and bearing in mind new compress is my baby i publish the books i want to publish um, i'm very very territorial it's very much me 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 and beep off everyone else because i publish what i want to read and in the hope that other people want to read it and david approached me this concept about basically saying you've got fairy stories and myths which resemble fairy stories in most cultures in the world around us. What would alien fairy stories in this be like? And so that was, I thought was a great concept. And we got together an anthology of stories from diverse authors called Once Upon a Parsec, which Dave is currently editing and sorting through. And um, well, you, you take it from there, sir. <coughs> so in, in terms of where the project is, we've got all the stories in. And can I say names? Yeah, yeah. Can I name drop? So who have we got? We've got Paul de Filippo, we've got Adrian Tchaikovsky, um, we've got uh, Chris Beckett, Jane Fenn, Liz Williams, um, anyone else you should, we should say? Oh, you? Gay, gay Savold. You? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and, and yes, that man over there. Um, Whose name you call Stephen Oren. <laughs> And Brian Pierce. And Brian Pierce. Um, and others. And others. <laughs> and it was a real and Neil Williamson. Um, and it was a difficult brief. Having having come up with this idea <coughs> and persuaded Ian, I think, for the first time ever, to let someone else have a go. Um, <laughs> for which I'm supremely grateful. That's okay, that you can buy me drinks later. Yeah. Very, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm flattered and, and I, th I think it's a great I'm slightly worried. Um, <laughs> it's having come up with this idea and then sent out all these uh, um, requests for such and things and people scratched their chins and said you know what Dave 
this is a really, really difficult brief. And I thought about it and said, you know what? It's a really, really difficult brief. I'm really glad that I'm editing this and not having to write a story <laughs> because I'm not sure where I would start. But the thing is, um, and that really is the main reason why I think it's been quite slow to actually bring it to completion. But the thing is, because it's been such an ask for so many writers. I wonder what you're going to say then. <laughs> so, <laughs> they've, they've all universally really, really come up with the goods. Oh, Kim. Um, Kim's done stories. Kim, Kim yes. Smith. Kim yes, Smith. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be really good. And the cover art is being done by Ben Baldwin, who did Chipotlets and many other new con books. Yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, again, based on an idea that um, Dave came up with, which is uh, the spaceman sitting with his visor up, reading from a book to a group of alien children. And that's going to be the cover art. So <laughs> looking forward to that. Did you say spaceman or space person? Space purse. Space yes. person. <laughs> I thought, well, I was going to get back to Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Ben, make it a woman. <laughs> Otherwise, George is going to kill me. This will we'll probably have it out for the summer, will we? Well, won't we? Yes. 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 So, that's ongoing, uh, which, yeah, I, I've been delighted by this because it, um, Dave's kept me fully informed. I haven't yet read any of the stories. Um, barring, I th I th that's a lie, I think I've read one of the stories so far, but um, I just love the concept and uh, I had great fun writing for it. Um, the story I originally wrote for it, weirdly missed out the most interesting aspect of the story because I thought that's relevant to the actual alien world, not to the fairy story. Um, but then I put it in and you, you rather like that idea. So. <laughs> yes. um, so yeah, that's coming out. Um, so you've been editing, and, and you've edited before. You you, um, you published me in an anthology for um, called Mind Seed. Yes, and and that was actually for a noble cause as well, wasn't it? Yes, that was for a, a writer in the Tea Party who uh, passed away, and we wanted as a group to do a um, uh, to commemorate her, publish a piece of her work because she had never been published, um, and. See if we could raise some money for her favourite charity. Um, so we did. That was my first dip into the water of, of that. My second one um, is a very strange thing that me and some friends came up with one more on holiday, and we had been drinking Dutch whiskey, which I recommend you never do because it's hallucinatory, weird stuff. It's not actually whiskey. I, 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 I know say, what it is. I, I think if you look up in the, in the dictionary. Um, Dutch and whiskey are not two words you often find together. Somebody brought a bottle, and uh, we went to a very strange place, and and, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we published a book of of, of, of wet plate collodion photography, short stories, haiku, um, called the Videnceive Epiphanies of Patty McNaval. Don't ask me where that title came from because none of us can remember. <laughs> Um, and all the stories, apart from two, are called that. Um, if you want a copy, email me and I'll send you one. Um, free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> because who played on this? That was great fun, I really enjoyed it. Um, and learnt a lot about laying out. Yeah. With, with trying to get bloody photographs of the books. Never do that. Thank you for the advice, I'll, I'll make sure I know. Um, Shipocalypse is your only professionally published novel to date? Yes. Is that something... That sounds wrong. I don't mean is it the fact that it's the only one something you're proud of, but is it a book you still feel proud of on standby? Oh yes, yes. Um, it was very hard work for me to do because it's got a certain voice and it was, it was difficult to maintain that voice rather than slide back into... Uh, a slightly easier voice. I wrote it because a lot of things were annoying me about the world and although I didn't want to get onto a soapbox I wanted to write about those things and, and ultimately propose a solution I think might possibly work but it's actually so implausible it would never happen. Um, and also just speculate about where we might be going and then as you say go to very odd places and things 
we, 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 we've, got the, we've got the cover here by Ben Baldwin. Ben did the original cover and this is a variation on that. But it occurred to me that if we didn't use that, we could have used the artist who designed covers for Mad magazine. I think you know, one, of the, one of the map bridges would be ideal for this. Yes. It has that insane quality of sanity about it. And I think that's probably the best thing I can say. I'm just going to read um, to finish with, and then we'll open up for um, questions from the audience. And in, something that, um, a, a, again, another up and coming author called uh, Mike Carey, um, who, as many of you know, was BAFTA nominated for The Girl with, with All the Gifts, said about the book. Packed with bold ideas and genre-shattering extrapolations, and the characters get so deep, deep inside your head, you're still arguing with them days later. Seriously, you need this book. I can only endorse what Mike says. This is a fantastic book. Um, it's not launched till Eastercom. We've dashed copies through to have them here today. Um, it's twelve ninety nine. But to you, fair folk, if anyone did want to buy one, we'd let you have it for a tenner, because that way I don't have to mess around with change. So there you go. <laughs> now, any questions? Any Sorry. questions from anyone? <laughs> no? no. <laughs> Georgie! Yes, I love one, I love one. <laughs> Georgie. So, um, Mr. Carr. Yes. Is he, is, is it really not based in any way um, on Kit from Night Rider? Let us see Night Rider. Right. Say yes, just because say when, yes, keep it happy. Because when I was reading Shapocalypse, What's Mr. Carr, Mr. Mr. Carr, um, you know, it was, it was in Kit's voice in my head. It was very amusing. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually quite no. watchable. I rewatched um, some Night Rider recently because I was showing it on some obscure preview channel. I was pleasantly surprised. You know that feeling you get when you're going to go back and watch shows from the 80s? How they could be good, how they go. I've forgotten that the lead mechanic was a woman, and they have um, they have a character of colour in the series later on. So tick tick, good job. For that for that day and age, that's quite progressive. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was happy. I've noticed this thing in my life, and whenever I say I will never do something, I then do it. Yeah, or whenever I that. think something stupid, then guess what? So when I was quite young. Um, Night Rider was on TV. I thought, why would I want to watch a stupid program about a talking car that's stupid? So, you know, guess what? Um, the car was actually not stupid. That was the whole point. <laughs> the car was the most intelligent character in the, book, in the, the program. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Roger. You wrote the book five years later, you revised it. Yes. Five years' time? <laughs> is, is that is that something you would dread or welcome? Depends. Um, I, I said it now feels like some sort of preferable version of, of, of the present, yeah. but I don't know. Spoilers. It's difficult to say. There was a time of about six to nine months, maybe about a year ago when I was thinking, dear God, has Donald Trump got hold of a copy of this? <laughs> <laughs> because I can kind of feel where it's going to go. Um, so yes, if, if he really has got hold of a copy of this, then no. Um, it'd be a very bad thing. There, there is a lot in the book that resonates with what's going on in America at the moment. Oh, yes. And yes. Um, whether that will still be the case in another five or six years' time, who knows where we're going to be. Yes. But at the moment, we've hit... A moment, we've hit we, we, we've hit a point of resonance, of, of singularity, where yes. the book suits the time. So it, in a way, it's very gratifying to write something you know, a few years back and say, I think this is going to happen, I think this is going to happen. And then when it edges towards it, you think, oh, oh, oh it has happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also stuff that I left out. So I suppose I think the one thing that I'm, I don't know, proud of, can I say that, is that I haven't mentioned the UK in the book at all. Because back then I thought we'll be irrelevant in the future. Um, <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> yeah, I know. You be. Um, so there you go. Ian. Oh, hi. Um, Because, because Donald Trump is fifth canon from 
Back to the Future 2, where he discovered this uh, sports results book. He traveled back to the future, but he used it to build up a giant, you know, complete imbecile, um, you know, asshole who managed to build up an incredible empire and become president of the USA. This, you know, would be explained by yep. having. Do you, do you know that that character was based on Donald Trump at the time? The director, the director actually based that character on Donald Trump. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. He admitted it. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's even more circular than you realised. So in some strange way you could say you couldn't make it up? No. <laughs> and of course, Idiocracy, which was a, was a really bad film, but it was yes. quite similar. Yeah. So a quick question would be, if uh, so a person like Jeff Bezos, who's like in 20, basically 20 years probably built Amazon, from like him selling books out of his garage and taking his books to mean this mega corporation with AIs in people's living rooms and building space uh, missions through blue origin and things like that. Do you, do you think someone like very rich. <laughs> um, but he's not that rich. He's only a billion. He's only got like 150 billion dollars. He's, he's not a trillionaire, is he? Um, <laughs> he's only got half that now. His wife's taking the rest. Yes. <laughs> but I think the interesting thing about being that rich for me um, was that you then become totally disconnected from everyone else to the point where you simply do not understand their lives. Um, and I... I think it's unfair to say that all enormously wealthy people are like that. But I think a lot of enormously people, wealthy people just simply don't understand what it's like to only have enough money to pay the rent and to not be able to afford your health care or, or whatever in, in your world. Because why shouldn't you? I met, I met a man once years ago, and this probably went into the mix. He was, he was very wealthy and lived down the rich end of my road. Um, and it was one of these crises, regular financial crises. And he said to me, in all honesty, that times were tough and he was down to his last yacht. <laughs> and and I, I, I just didn't know what to say at that point. <laughs> because, you know, what, what do you say? You say, fuck me, that, that's difficult, you know. Sorry, mate. Um, and he clearly didn't understand what, what it was like to genuinely be on your uppers and your last pair of shoes and you don't know what you're going to eat tomorrow. Um, and I think that's, that's the interesting thing about these fantastically rich people. They're, they're, and also, sorry, I'm, I'm going to go off now. No, I'll, I'll and, also, and also, they think that solutions are top down, that you just chuck money at the problem and it goes away, as opposed to giving small amounts of money to people who live their own lives and say, you know what you need best. You don't need yeah. infrastructure, you don't need the UN charities, etc. etc. What you need is five hundred dollars now or yeah. something like that. Um, don't give a man a fish a fishing rod. Don't give a man a fish, give him a fishing rod. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. Suddenly, so don't buy him a trawler, and then yeah. say, well, "Yes, I yeah. can't afford diesel." Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a wonderful line which I didn't actually see the program, but I saw it widely reported, which I think summed up exactly what you were saying. And it was a wag in um, "I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here," who said, "People don't understand how difficult it is being rich." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us would really like to find. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the, the solutions in the. Yeah. Exactly. In that statement, yes. really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to learn. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Yes. Right. So, do we have any further questions? Oh, sorry, guys. Um, a bit of frivolity first, and then a serious question for that. I should have mentioned that Ian and Helen go back the big long way and I consider them friends but they don't necessarily reciprocate and that's understandable. Someone is Dave G. The lovely gay and I also 
the same situation. Uh, I've visited the Brazil and don't necessarily again. And I must also mention at Bristol Con last year on the Sunday afterwards, Dave G, Dave Valley, and Dave all sat side by side at a writer's seminar, correct? And I gave my very first science fiction short story. No. It's come to see, wait, here. Woo. The reaction was incredible. I don't know who this writer is, but he said it's even worse than someone called Ron L. Hubbard or whatever he was. <laughs> now on to the serious question. Dave G to Eden. Which, that's the frivolity out of the way. The serious question is, which classic science fiction writers inspire you in the sense of their stories, their philosophies, their ethos and so on? It's a more serious question from what I've just frivolously given you. Tough one, isn't it? You are allowed to say none of them. <laughs> no, the, the people whose work I love and learned some years ago, don't try and copy, try to emulate, if you like. Uh, Jack Vance. Oh, Jack, the late Jack yes. Vance. Um, J.G. Ballard. Uh, Kate Wilhelm. Um, who didn't write much, but she really wrote about things that. Um, Frank Herbert before he wrote June because <laughs> um, he wrote I think he wrote some really really interesting books and he wrote a very early eco warrior book if you like called The Green the Brain, Brain yeah. which fascinated yeah. me um, Brian Aldis that's probably enough from, from my perspective I'll say I, I've never tried to emulate any author but I suspect every author I ever read has bled into me and helped yeah. shape me. And, mm. and so I think it's been a process of osmosis rather than deliberate influence. I mean, I, I gobbled up everything that Roger Zelazny wrote. Like you, Jack Vance's, yes. Jack Vance's unique voice was, yes. was a wonder to behold. I, I, after much persuading, I, I got Ian Watson, who, who's a science fiction fan, doesn't read fantasy, but he read Hope Murley's Love in the Mist. And he emailed me straight away and said, I bet Jack Vance wrote this as a young man. <laughs> because there is something just quirky and strange in Mirley's writing, which, yes, you can see it in Vance. Yes. Um, so th there are all these people. And uh, I, I, I'm, I was a huge Frank Herbert fan, the Green Brain, the Sardi Experiment, and, yes. and, and Dune itself, I thought, was phenomenal. Not, not necessarily the sequel so much. But all of these bled in, but I never consciously sat down and thought, I'm going to write a story like this or like that. Yeah. It's just been a case of, I'm sure, and, and Fritz Leiber's another one. Fritz Leiber, another wonderful author. Rob Holdstock. Yeah, Hol and Rob Holdstock, yeah. yes. Oh, what a man. But I'm sure all these have bled in and influenced, and somehow it comes out in my writing, but I'm probably some sort of chimera, producing bits and pieces of all of them without being conscious of it. An amalgam of them. Yes. That is amazing. That's that's that. Yeah. And, and such a terrific voice. I, I will just mention one other name, um, Tanith Lee. Mm. Oh, Tanith Lee, whose word yes. structure and his yes. writing, I just, the, the first time I read her, my jaw just hit the ground. Yes. The pictures she painted with her words and the way she shaped sentences was <laughs> astonishing. And she's someone, uh, Helen and I were lucky enough to um, know Tanith in her latter life and become firm mm -hmm. friends with her. And it's a friendship I will always cherish. And she's an individual I'll always miss. She came on to the Dead Dogs after Octagon a few years ago. We decided on the Dead Dogs and Octagon the Irish Commission. She sat up to be with Chad for almost the hours. And everyone was completely oblivious. Fantastic lady. Sadly gone now, but that's like so many others. Well, she, she was someone who could write whole novels in the chapter. Yes. That any other writer would have, would have taken those ideas that she just used so succinctly and said, well, that's going to be my next trilogy. But there it was, it was just a chapter, and then another, and another one. I, I, I was on holiday when I first discovered Tans, not, not that she was on holiday at the same place, but um, I'd run out of reading material, went into a bookshop and discovered the, all three volumes of her secret book of parodies. And I'd never read her. She was someone I'd always heard of but never read. I got these books and I sat there and just read them and thought, my God. You know, it wasn't really the type of stuff I enjoyed reading because it was very much SF. But the joy of reading words like that, of reading sentences like that. That's, I just, the, that's the joy of Jack France as well. Yes. He, yeah. yes. he can construct sentences that no one else can. No, yes. and, and, yes. And, and I hate footnotes in books, but Jack Vance, I loved every footnote because he would suddenly describe an entire language or an entire sports game in a footnote. Yeah. And you'd be playing this, you know, forget Quidditch, you'd be playing this wonderful alien game and think, how the heck did this man come up with this? <laughs> and and in, in his latter days, he wrote a couple of novels and he was obviously declining in health. Um, Ports of Call and 
Louis? Yes, Louis Louis. Yes. And I know Louis Louis is generally regarded as an inferior Vance novel. I loved every word of it. For me, it was everything about Jack Vance, just this spaceship pottering from planet to planet, culture to culture, mm -hmm. and you encountering completely new ideas. And, and that's one reason why um, I was very privileged to publish Rachel Armstrong's debut novel, Laura Garvey. And she does this. In, a, in, a, in a one page, she will unveil a whole civilization on an alien world. And on the next page, she's visiting another one. I'm telling you, and I just, I thought, wow, and there, not in her style of writing, not in the way she shapes sentences, but in her imagination, she reminded me of Jack Vance. And I love that nostalgic, wow, the last person I read who did this was Vance. And, and so, yes, I'm sorry, I'm going to shut up now because it's your interview. <laughs> sorry. Thank you both. Just to comment on Jack Vance at the Belgian Convention, I was telling us, there's a lot of stuff about Jack Vance. Translated into Dutch in this country. But wasn't it that he was blind in the last 10 or 15 years of his life? He lived a very long yes, time. Yes. 97, I Very, think. very poor eyesight. Exactly. Yeah. He went to blind or something in his last few years. some of his greatest yeah. books. Well, yeah. Yeah. He had, he had um, laser treatments on his eyes to try and correct the crime and vision, and it blinded him. It went horribly wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the classics. So he wrote it, and as I understand it, he wrote his books one word at a time in 72 point on the screen. Yes, uh, yeah. If there are any other classic authors you'd like to discuss, <laughs> <laughs> before we finish, um, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I feel flattered and privileged that you've asked me here. Uh, I really, really do. So thank you very, very much. Really. No, thank you.